Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Between Two Studs. I'm Alex Stud. And I'm Ron Stud. Ron, it's episode 30, the big three zero. Wow. That's like... Yeah. That's that's actually kind of crazy. I'm actually really excited to be at this mile marker, right? I am, too. So, so tonight, not only do we have a great guest, as always, but we also have some exciting news to share. Oh, what's that? No, I'm kidding. I know what it is. All right. So for all of our wonderful listeners and all of our fans, I, I think you all know Alex and I certainly enjoy a specific beverage, possibly the king of beverages. That is Jepson's Malort. Our dear friends at Jepson's Malort, we've reached out to them, and those wonderful people there have agreed to actually become the official sponsors of Between Two Studs for all of Season 2. So we're really excited. Uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to be probably getting a few things from Malort, and we're looking forward to actually including that on our show. But I think, as with every single episode, Alex, we have to start this off correctly. And to start things correctly, you got to start with a shot of Malort. Cheers. So, cheers. Fantastic. Delicious. So we're very excited um, about that partnership. As Ron said, you'll be seeing some stuff both on our Instagram page and in the episodes themselves where we really highlight and showcase Malort even more than we have before because now we have the official partnership. So really excited about that. But without further ado, Ron, why don't we kick things off? We have a wonderful guest on the show tonight. Yes. So our guest tonight is Ryan Hennessy. So Ryan, thank you for coming on the show. Hey, guys. Glad to be here. All right, Ryan. Now, I understand that you're a listener of our show, yep. so thank you very much for that. Sure. So, you know what the first part of our show always is, right? Let's do the Ember Round. Oh, heck yeah. All right. So, let's get started. How do you know us? Um, I know Ron. I uh, haven't met Alex, but uh, me and Ron uh, worked on a project together and kind of like stayed in touch ever since. Awesome. All right. And tell us a little bit about yourself, areas of expertise and general interests. Man, um, I'm interested in a lot of stuff. Uh, anyone who knows me well is like, dude, you you need to like focus. Uh, but <laughs> I just, I can't stop. I'm always, uh, always learning, always looking for that next thing. Um, and I just, uh, just into a lot of stuff. Um, professionally, um, right now I'm a bum. <laughs> no, I- okay. uh, I, I took some time off from work um, for my family. Um, I got a really great opportunity to, you know, kind of be a stay-at-home dad. Um, so that's kind of been my uh, last, geez, I guess it's been almost uh, like coming up on two years now. Um, but <clears throat> the majority of my work professional career was in, uh, was in kitchens. Um, mm. Been really lucky. Got to work with some amazing people. Got to work all over the country. Um, and you know, that's been, uh, my passion just doesn't, uh, doesn't mend well with, uh, having a small child at home. Um, and I've done other things too. Uh, I've worked in the cannabis industry, uh, I've owned my own business. My wife and I have our, uh, uh, business now that we work at from home, just, you know, take care of the kids, pay the bills. Uh, she does 98% of the work. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, uh, just hanging out in COVID land, I guess. And, uh, enjoying enjoying my time. That's awesome. awesome. Well, I, I, I will say you are our second chef to be on the program after Ruben. So we're going to have to talk about that towards the end of the show for sure. Definitely. Kind of switching, kind of switching gears. I see you just had a sip of something. Mm -hmm. Tell us what was that drink? What are you working on? Um, well, actually, um, I'm, I'm actually not a big drinker. I used to, especially like being in the industry and in kitchens, it's like just kind of goes with goes with the territory you know it's like you know always have a drink at the end of the night sometimes people buy you drinks in the middle of your shift and you just got it down on cheers i'm 110 degrees and i haven't eaten for you know a full meal and hours and uh you know you're making me do a shot of whatever you decide to buy me but um actually i have the bottle right here okay drinking will it oh <clears throat> very so, nice bourbon uh you know nothing too fancy um great it's like kind of my go-to so if i if i have a bourbon i usually grab that bottle 
Awesome. So cheers, guys. Cheers. cheers. Ron, what are you working on? So sadly, I think anybody who listened to our last episode remembers, I'm doing a 75-day challenge where it involves some degree of sobriety, exercise, and a bunch of other things. But uh, tonight I'm just sadly having green tea. What about you, Alex? Well, in honor of Ryan, I am having a Massachusetts drink. I am having Boston Harbor Distillery Merry Maker Gingerbread Stout. It's an American, it's an American whiskey. And it tastes pretty good. It kind of, it's very wintry as a uh, kind of gingerbread kind of flavor, a little vanilla, a little cinnamon. I wouldn't have this over the summer, that's for sure. But right now, it's very delicious. Hmm. That sounds like they really put a lot of complexity in that. Say that one more time just to make sure I heard it all. It is Boston Harbor Distillery's Merry Maker Gingerbread Stout American Whiskey. Uh, This actually... Cater, this is from Flaviar, who, what we've talked about okay. on the show before. So this is like, you get samples of different drinks. I, I would never, I think it's a micro distillery. I don't think I ever would have tried this otherwise. So, but maybe you can find it out there, Ryan. Yeah. I, I mean, with a name that long, I'm sure it'll stand out really <laughs> easily. <laughs> it wraps around the bottle a couple times. Yeah. They just have it spinning on a pedestal in the front of the store. <laughs> The president input with eggnog, holiday cheer, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I do want to admit one thing, too, for our, our listeners. We do actually have tonight, we're testing out the audience function um, with our new platform. So we do have our audio engineer, official or unofficial, Dan. Um, so he's actually listening. He did want to chime in and say that he is enjoying some McAllen. So I hope you enjoy that as well, sir. Nice. So, uh Thank you, Dan, as always. Ryan, next question, as you know, on the Ember Round, we always ask our guests some piece of artwork, uh, some type of literature, something that speaks to you. We've gotten some great responses uh, in the 29 episodes we've done this. What's yours? Man, I mean, I like uh, I like a bunch of stuff, like I said, to begin with. And, you know, I'm, I'm down with the art. I don't think I'm... Uh, a great artist myself per se. Um, but I guess, uh, man, it's so hard. Um, I guess I would have to say kind of like, I guess I'll start off with saying like what art kind of means, you know? So you have, uh, you know, a painting, a sculpture, a song, and, you know, you can enjoy that by a sensory input. So a song is, you know, if you're live, you can watch them and you can hear the music. If you're at a museum, you know, you could maybe touch a sculpture and use your eyes. Um, but I think my favorite form of art would be a, a plate of food. And that's just because it kind of overtakes all of your senses at once. And so the depth of which you can elicit a response out of someone is endless uh, compared to, you know, another form factor. So it might be generalistic, but I'm going to say a plate of food. I actually, so first and foremost, you're the first person, as far as I know, to give us like their philosophy ah. of, <laughs> uh, uh, of art. I, I, at least as far as I remember, the first person to talk about the different sensories and definitely the first guest to talk specifically about food. And it is true. I mean, how many other art forms can you interact with with all five senses? Yeah, and it's like one of those things, too, that um, one of my favorite artists, um, if you want to break it down to like, uh, you know, like an actual person who creates art, um, is uh, Andy Goldworthy. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's like a crackpot guy, and this guy's on a different planet. But uh, he creates um, these really crazy, um, like, nature scapes. So he goes out into nature, and he will, uh, like, carve a piece of ice or he will stack rocks or do like if you just like look it up um he does amazing work but those works don't last you know they're gonna break down over time or they're gonna break down really quickly and so um maybe it's just that's the kind of art i'm into is like the creator presents the art and then it never lasts just like a plate of food just like walt whitman's nothing gold can stay there you go Very nice. All right. So for our next question, this has been one that we've recently added to the mix, as I'm sure you're aware. 
Uh, but when it comes to COVID, I know that's changed a lot of our lives. And for many of us, it's changed like things that we do or added new things to our lives, including Alex and I, of course, the, this podcast. What's one way that COVID has impacted you for positive? Um, for positive, to be 100% honest, it really didn't change much. Um, obviously, I lost the you know ability to safely do things with you know friends, family, um, exploring. Um, but it's, I guess, you know, it's really, uh, really didn't change my day to day because right before COVID happened, I decided that I wanted to take a break from, you know, the world really, and just mm -hmm. focus on my, on my son. Um, so I was incredibly lucky that it didn't impact my life, uh, for a negative at all. Um, I was, I was in the COVID mindset sort of, um, when it hit. So, um. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess it's just kind of, it's allowed me to, to appreciate the things, um, you know, that, that we've lost, uh, more, um, you know, I live in a pretty small area, so, um, you know, it's, it's been nice. It's been easy, uh, to get through, um, just because there's not a ton of people, there's plenty of outdoor space. I mean, it is cold right now and I don't want to be outside, um, but you know, if, even if it wasn't COVID, I would still be kind of stuck at home because it's going to be like negative 10 tomorrow or the next day. So, <laughs> Oof. well, it sounds yeah, like well, it, it's been a great opportunity for you, even though it wasn't directly as a result of COVID to really spend more time with your son. Yeah, it's been great. Um, you know, uh, these young years are, you know, super important for, you know, development and, uh, you know, Unfortunately for him, he just has to develop with his dad instead of like other cool kids. So, <laughs> Very nice. Well, congratulations. You've made it through the Ember Round. And with that, um, give me a second. There we go. Uh, but wait, you got to cut it off short. Yeah, you got to find a fader or something, Ron. <laughs> I mean... We learned that last episode. There was like that cheering that goes on. For like it went way too long. Seconds. Yeah. yeah, this is not a this is not a standing ovation, Ryan. You haven't done that yet. No, I <laughs> I I don't feel like I deserve it at all. So you could just completely cut that out of the audio and just you could even put like boo <laughs> in there. I'd be happy. We'll keep that. In mind. Ah. We'll keep that in mind. <laughs> all right. So so we're past the ember round. You gave us a little bit of the background on on kind of what you've been up to, but. You know, I really want to dive into a little bit more. You talked about your involvement and interest in the cannabis industry and specifically mm -hmm. your background in cannabis breeding. Can you talk about that? How did you even end up doing that? Um, well, I'm, I'm not a not a cannabis breeder per se, um, but, you know, I've worked uh, I've worked in a couple different realms, uh, more of like the cultivation side. Um, and uh some more of like extract work so more lab work um you know i'm not a <clears throat> i'm not um you know great in all aspects but i guess my uh my area of expertise is um solventless extracts uh, we can get into that more but um would you, would you consider yourself um a chemist oh 100 percent. and that's just how i've been my whole life i mean i consider myself a a scientist through and through. Um, it's just anything that has to do with science. I'm a hundred percent into, um, cannabis being a, a great realm. Um, you know, as, as we've seen, you know, as a, as a country, it's a, you know, a hot topic. There's a lot of research going on, a lot of changes happening. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot to be, uh, a lot to be learned, um, there. And then also with my culinary background, I mean, you would talk about science and an epic level and, uh, you know, just the variables involved in, you know, anywhere from growing a piece of food to, uh, you know, getting it into someone's mouth is, is pretty epic. So, um, yeah, the, the science aspect of, of anything is almost like the, the initial precursor of me being interested in it. So did you start off as like a gardener for plants in terms of yeah. digestible food and then work your way in to yeah. pot or how'd that work? For sure. Um, so, you know, even when I was a kid, you know, family had a, a small garden in the back. And then as soon as I started to, you know, develop into a, 
into a, a, a cook, a chef, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, finding solid product is the key. You know, you can't turn shit into sugar. Um, mm -hmm. So start with good product. Don't mess it up and uh, present it in, you know, whatever way you feel fit. And, you know, that's kind of where, where good food starts. So Ryan, I learned that from, from Pizza Hut. Yeah, no, no. Uh, wait, who was it that says, uh, no, it's, it's Papa John's better pizza, better ingredients, better ingredients, Papa John. Okay. Papa John's. Sure. That's how yeah. I got it. John, John <laughs> was, was spitting game. Um, but no, so I, you know, I obviously like everyone kind of like, Oh, let's grow some tomatoes at the house. And when I was a kid, I was like, oh, that's cool. Let me go pick one of these while I'm playing out in the yard. Um, and then I got more serious about it and, you know, started to, uh, to, you know, develop relationships with farms. Um, you know, that's like kind of the, the first thing that changed my mind on like how food is grown. So, you know, if, as a chef, you want the best product possible, you know, you, you need to go find it. And a lot of times that's going to be locally or even not locally, but you need to, you need to source uh, the correct product and the best product that you can find. So you can put in front of your, your clients, uh, you know, on their plate. So I kind of got into it, um, that way where like seeing some of the best of the best people, um, growing some of the best product and, you know, grocery stores don't have that kind of stuff. And, you know, I can, uh, I can cook that stuff all day at the restaurant, but you know, if I want to eat at home, um, it just kind of seemed natural that I needed to start, uh, learning how to produce the best quality product so I can have great food even when I'm not in the restaurant. Um, and so, yeah, I started growing vegetables, um, got pretty serious into it and, you know, I was super lucky enough that, uh, you know, I lived in a state where they decided that, you know, you can use, grow, kind of go all out and, uh, you know, the, the, the cannabis, uh, veil was lifted and, um, it was, uh, it was on after that. I was like, oh, that sounds like fun. I'll try that. And also like, you know. Um, living in Massachusetts and we can't grow vegetables, you know, six months out of the year. Um, so it was, uh, it was almost ideal for me that I could, uh, I could kind of have the best of both worlds. I could grow outside vegetables and then in the winter time, um, I could, uh, I could grow indoors. Very cool. Now I know you were talking a little bit with chemistry about solvents and extraction, um, if you don't mind, let's simplify that down a little bit uh, to, to your average layman person. What does that really mean? You're, I'm assuming that's where you're extracting what's really the good stuff out of sure. uh, cannabis, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you have this, uh, you have this plant, right? And, um, you know, it has tons of different compounds. I believe we've located like right around like 480 different components of a cannabis plant. Um, and a lot of those are, you know, just the normal structures of like a lot of other plants out there. Um, <clears throat> but there are some that are, you know, psychoactive, psychotropic. Um, and so uh, you can take all of those components out of a plant uh, through various extraction methods. Um, so you don't need to, um, you know, combust the whole plant in order to get its effects. Um, you know, we've been seeing a, a weird, uh, nationwide craze for CBD. And so that's just like one component that comes out of the plant and that's extracted in, you know, various different ways. But, um, just an example is like, you know, you're taking this plant, you're growing it, and then you're fractionating off, uh, different compounds. Um, so you have like, a uh, uh, cannabergolic acid, which is like the precursor to um, all of the psychotropic aspects of a cannabis plant. So that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's developed in the plant uh, kind of in the early age. And then as that plant matures um, and towards the end of its life cycle, it starts to break down into separate components. And that's where you're going to get your uh, THC, your CBD, and some of your other components that, um, you know, not mm -hmm. everyone might understand or know about, but are definitely becoming more prevalent in the public eye. And definitely if you live in a state uh, where you can, uh, you can go source out, uh, you know, whatever cannabis products are legal to you. Yeah. Kind of in that same vein, Ryan, I'm curious, obviously between two studs advocates staying within your local laws, follow your jurisdictions, but in States where you can grow legally, 
and you can consume, is it relatively easy to synthesize? And uh, how, how, can you explain, like, is sure. this something that an average person could learn or? Yeah. And that's kind of been my, uh, my area of expertise. Um, so, you know, I can go down the street and I can have thousands of products available to me. There's plenty of dispensaries around here. Um, you know, it's just one of those things we were one of the, the first states to, you know, implement uh, a sale to the public. Um, and so, you know, the, the companies around here have been hard at work at developing tons of different products um, and all different shapes, forms, kind of whatever you want. Um, but I still I still stand behind uh, growing your own. Um, you know, it's not for everyone. Um, you know, there's a, a huge uh, carbon footprint to it. So, you know, anyone who's um, considering that, uh, you know, I would say um, you can actually, you know, grow more efficiently than maybe even some of like the huge um, facilities, but you, you need to know your stuff. Um, and, you know, so that's one thing, but if, if you have the ability to, you know, grow outside or, you know, growing inside, like I said, is, is, is great. Um, you can um, extract like, you know, the, the psychotropic, all the good stuff that you want out of the plant yourself. Um, and like I said, that's kind of something that, that I've been, uh, you know, working on for many years. So like I said, you can go down to uh, the dispensary down the street and you can get flowers, you can get edibles, you can get uh, extracts. And, you know, there's, uh, there's so many different varieties. So it's... Uh, well, you know. and, and Ryan, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but no, I, sure. I think that's, that's actually a question I had is, you know, a lot of states now are popping up and all of a sudden it's, it's recreational illegal. Right. And I think there are a lot of people who are like, honestly, especially middle aged people, mm -hmm. but like, I may have not never consumed marijuana in my life. Um, or maybe I did in college and I haven't since. And now all of a sudden I have a menu that is ridiculous. Right. And it's like, oh, there's the sativas and there's the indicas. And could, can you explain? And I know this is like really level setting, but really. What, what would you recommend to someone walking into a dispensary for the first time where to even begin? I mean, before even thinking about growing, just to get interested in trying and consuming cannabis. Sure. Well, I think, you know, any, any good dispensary is going to be able to guide you. Um, you know, like I said, there's a ton of different products on the menu and a lot of them might not be great for the first time. The extracts, which, you know, are concentrated THC, you know, probably aren't the best for a, for a first time or even someone that, you know, smoked 20 years ago. Um, the plants have changed. Um, you know, the, the, the breeders and the growers, they've done a, an amazing job and there's so much work that is involved in, um, you know, pushing uh, the cannabis industry forward with better products and more flavors and, you know, for people who want like more CBD, you know, they're, they're doing relentless work into isolating like specific components of the plant so that the, the end user can kind of get, get what they want. So, you know, I would, I would definitely consult with, uh, with any of the, the, the people at the dispensary. I think that's like the, really the important. Bud tenders. Yeah. The bud tenders. Um, but I would say, you know, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have flour. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a go-to um, where, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty standard. If you've ever used the cannabis plant before you, that's probably how you did it. Um, edibles are another really easy way because you don't need to um, have a device to smoke it out of, or it's kind of discreet. So if you have children, you don't want to like, you know, whatever, everyone's different. Um, I would just say, you know, pick something that looks good to you and start small. Um you know, don't, don't overdo it, especially with edibles. I know a lot of states are, are, are capping, you know, how much can be in, in one dosage, but. Uh, wait, wait, Ryan, you're saying if I pop an edible and I don't feel anything within five minutes, I shouldn't just keep popping more. Uh, yeah, that, that is correct. <laughs> and, and wait, with, with that too, what you're saying is like that whole brownie that I bought, 
don't drink, eat the whole brownie all at once. Well, if you bought it from a legal dispensary, it will tell you yes. how much to eat. So if it says eat this whole brownie, go for it. But you'll know exactly how much you're getting into. And the reason because of that is that they're not using flour, mixing it in. Like flour, when I say like the cannabis flour, um, they're, okay. using, they're using most likely distillate which is an extract, um, and it is almost 100% THC. So it's distilled THC, and it's very easy to dose from that. So if you're going to make edibles, um, you know, you can even buy distillate from the dispensary. So if you want to make edibles at home, I would say that that's your best shot because you can weigh it. You know exactly how many milligrams per dosage you, know, you end up with. So instead of just mixing a bunch of flour and butter together and hoping for the best, there, there's better ways. So, so you, we actually do have a question that came in from our audience. Thank you, audience, for that. Um, they actually did ask, so if you have the plant itself, how do we go from the plant into the extract to creating the edible? Like, what, sure. what's a high level on that, if you don't mind? Well, yeah, and that's kind of what I was going to get to before is, like, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, normally, uh, in production facilities nowadays, uh, most of them are you kind of, transferred over to CO2 or um, uh, butane. So basically you take a plant material and you extract it using a hydrocarbon. So that being, you know, CO2. So you have, uh, you know, a liquid hydrocarbon, super cold, and you basically force this hydrocarbon through the plant material uh, on this giant machine. And what comes out is called purge. Um, so it's like this, it's kind of aerated because it's under pressure. Um, so you have this like sludge that comes out and then from there you can do many things with it. Um, so it's like basically just stripping off all of the, what are called trichomes. So um, if you ever like look at the cannabis plant or if you just like Google search some images, you'll see like, you know, whether it be green, purple, whatever of the actual flower, the color, but then coating that flower is um, usually like this like white fuzz, whatever you want to call it. And if you look under a microscope, it almost looks like little mushrooms. So it has a stalk and a head. And um, that is where all of the psychotropic compounds are stored in the plant. So you're basically stripping all of those, um, you know, heads and stalks off of a plant. And then from there, what you do with it, um, there's many different ways. Um, <clears throat> so you can use uh, crazy machines. You can use like a fractionation machine where you basically are stripping um, specific terpenes. Uh, so like the smell, the esters off of the plant. And, um, and then you're also like fractionating um, like individual uh, components. Um, so it's, again, it's very technical and, and sciencey, um, but when you, you break it down, um, you know, let's say you took all the terpenes off of, uh, what came out of that. Um, so it's kind of flavorless and then you would basically <clears throat> winterize that. So you take off all the fat. So you put it in like a, a really, really, really cold freezer and you would let the, the fat solidify. You remove the fats because you don't want those in an extract. And then what's left after that, you would put in a rotary evaporator, which we've used in kitchens before, which is kind of cool. It's like crossover equipment. And then you would, um, you know, you'd basically evaporate anything, uh, moisture, or anything else left in that sludge. And what you would get is like this ridiculously hard to work with product where it's like honey on steroids. So if you took honey and you made it like 30 times harder and it would just be like stringy and that's, that's distillate. So, um, it's, you know, a good distillate's probably like 99.7% THC and doesn't have much flavor. Um, you can eat it straight up and it will do what an edible will do to you. You can dab it, which would be like, you know, vaporizing it and, and as like smoke and inhaling it. And uh, yeah, so that's where like your edibles um, would be made from. So you're basically taking a plant material, running it through a machine, uh, taking out anything else that can be used and then distilling that down with some pretty expensive equipment into uh, into a ridiculously weird consistency and then adding that to whatever. But um, you everyone know, you, followed that, right? Yeah, everyone at right? home, you, you know, you know, everyone followed the instructions. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. If you have about uh, thirty thousand dollars, you could definitely do this at home. No problem. But, um, you know, once uh once cannabis kind of became more mainstream, um, there's some smart people that kind of came up with some different ways and some of the people I learned from. And there are other ways to extract 
uh, those trichomes, those uh, heads off of the plant, other than using ridiculously expensive equipment and hydrocarbons. Um, there is a way to do it uh, with just heat and pressure. Um, and that's where, um, you know, I've done a lot of study in, which is uh, rosin. Um, <clears throat> So there is a way where you can take a flower, just a straight up, you know, a piece of the cannabis plant that's been dried, cured, um, and you can put it in between two pieces of parchment paper in between two heated metal plates. And if you put enough pressure on it, you really squish it, all of those trichomes will melt and extract onto the, the parchment paper. And you can collect that with a tool and there you have rosin. And that is uh, um, I was thinking it looks like a like a burger. Yeah, it's basically it's basically two metal <laughs> plates that are heated up very precisely, and usually use like a, a press of some sort, like you know, tons and tons of pressure, and you squish that together, and you have an extract that has all of the great you know the terpenes, the the psychoactive components of it, and that is ready to to be you know consumed in the form of uh you know a vapor heated up and, and smoked really um wow yeah so I, I have one question so you were talking about the the, the distillate right mm -hmm. which which ultimately you said it's like a very viscous consistency right it is like it's it's hard like you could roll it up into a ball and throw it at someone and it would hurt so if you need to like pull it apart it'll like think if you took like r like saltwater taffy um, I that's been in your pocket for like a couple of hours, but weighs like three times or four times as much, is much denser. But that consistency of like pulling it off, that's kind of what distillate is. And like I said, you know, you could get it from a dispenser, it usually comes in a syringe, so it's a little easier to work with. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just like a, it's an amber, it literally looks like, uh, you know, uh, you know, from like Jurassic Park, you have the, the mosquito. Yeah, the um, amber. Yeah. It kind of looks like that. It's it's pretty clear and it's got that amber color and it's um it's well, it's great stuff, so, but So let me ask about that. Like you said you could consume it right then and there. So if, if you're someone who let's say you you consume edibles and you're like I have 10 milligrams, could you simply give yourself 10 milligrams of this distillate and it's more or less the same thing? It would be exactly the same thing as long as, you know, there's uh, there are companies that are making um, products that don't use distillate, but it's, it's pretty common. Um, weighing a 10 milligram dose of distillate, you would need a pretty ridiculous scale because um, you got to think that one gram of this would be like 997 milligrams of THC. So if you want to do a 10 milligram dose, good luck. Like the residual, like, uh, you know, what was left on like a tiny little tool that you used could even be over that. So that's why like large batch, um, large batches. Uh, you got to uh, water it down. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like you're going to have this thing on your desk and be like, oh, I'm just going to take a little bit of that and go to town. No, it's, it's not like that. But again, you're, you're talking like a, a, a distilled product. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's potent. Yeah. So I, I what, imagine what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I think one of the things I really want to touch on, Ryan, pick your brain about is just the industry at large, right? I feel like everyone now is seeing this Delta 8 thing, and it's just like every shop on earth is selling it in every grocery store and gas station. And it's like, yep. I don't know what that is. You know, people are talking about it was CBD a year ago, and now it's Delta 8. I want to get into all that and sort of talk about what's going on and the trends Sure. And uh, and then and then we'll talk a little bit more about the food, uh, your food passion. So that's good. Well, hey everyone, Ron here, and I want to take a quick moment to thank you for being a listener. But one thing I'd ask, if you're able to do so, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could give us a review of our podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or join our Discord server. We'd greatly appreciate it, and we'll be posting a link to our Discord server in today's episode. Thank you so much. And we're back with Between Two Studs. We're chatting with Ryan Hennessy, and we're talking about marijuana. Uh, you know, Ryan, before we went to break, I kind of prefaced, you know, for someone who is just kind of, I read the New York Times, I read the Wall Street Journal, everyone now on Earth is talking about this Delta. And I feel like it just came out of nowhere. I'd never even heard of it. And then they're talking about, well, this is different than Delta 9. 
And I'm like, I've never heard of that. And they're like, yeah, but it's nothing like CBD. And I'm like, well, CBD, that was like the thing a year ago, two years ago. I was getting bombarded on Facebook and Instagram about it. Can you just like level set? What the hell is going on? Can try. Um, uh, it's Delta Eight has popped up uh, past my uh, past my industry prime. Um, I obviously know a little bit about it, um, and there's still there's so many gray areas. It's almost impossible to keep up on the walls with this. It kind of took uh, regulation um, for like a loop. Uh, they weren't exactly sure, like you know, how this came about. And like I said at the beginning of the podcast that there's there's so much to be learned there's so many things that that need to be done and uh you know experimented with um it's just uh these things are going to be popping up and there's there's just no stopping it <laughs> so um i guess uh circling back um delta eight and you also heard of delta nine um these are what are considered isomers so if you remember from like high school chemistry class, these are basically compounds that are extremely similar with like a slight variation. And the Delta-9 and the Delta-8 um, are basically just uh, specifically stating which carbon chain has a double bond. So the eighth carbon chain has a double bond on Delta-8, the ninth carbon chain has a double bond on Delta-9. Both are as far as I know, are psychotropic. However, Delta-8 is about 50 to 70% less um, potent than uh, Delta-9. And Delta-9 is just your basic THC. It's what, you know, it's what you feel when you smoke flour, um, you know, standard extracts, um, not necessarily edibles, um, but we, we can get into that. It might even be a whole another, another topic. But well, so so that that was my understanding where Delta Eight is more or less the the little brother uh, in terms of potency of your traditional Delta Nine, which again I'd never heard of before. Yeah, but Delta Nine is is what everyone knows of as traditional marijuana. Your standard um, high you, that you get from like if you were to just smoke raw flour from the cannabis plant. So now there do, is do you, there is delta eight in cannabis, but it is an extremely low level. Can you touch on, to the best of your knowledge, why all of a sudden this has become a huge trend, and furthermore, why are there states where marijuana is illegal, yet delta eight is a okay? So a lot of that has to do with where delta eight is being derived from. So under federal law. Um, the hemp plant, which is where you get like CBD from, um, has to have a concentration of THC less than 0.3%. So hemp is federally legal as long as the THC content is less than 0.3%. And that's where you get like your CBD from. Now with Delta-8, I'm not 100% sure on this, so don't quote me, but I feel like Delta-8 uh, came from the surplus of CBD. So you have this huge CBD boom, which is great. You know, CBD, you know, I, I, I can't speak for everyone. Um, you know, this, this plan is amazing and it affects everyone differently. Um, CBD, uh, it's gotten a bad rap, um, but I still think there's something there. It's just the quality and the potency and it's just, there's not enough regulation. Um, where, you know, as the cannabis industry, we're just like, oh, no, don't regulate. Just leave us alone. Let us do our thing. And I don't necessarily think, at least personally, that that's, that's the best for, for the uh, industry moving forward. And, so, and just for the listeners, just, just the level set, CBD does not get you high. It's, it's, that it's is more correct. supposed to be more it is, of a relaxant. It is not a psychotropic as far as the, you know, FDA and the, fed, the feds are concerned. Um, but Delta-8 technically is so if you took a, a huge intake of delta 8 you might actually feel some effects now those effects are going to be different than thc um a thc delta 9 <laughs> so um delta 8 would give you a more relaxing uh calming effect and also stays in your system a little bit longer so it's not as like you know you take a huge dab or you 
take a bowl rip or joint, whatever you decide, you know, to, to intake, you know, you kind of have that, that instant, like I'm going to take this hit and now I have the feelings. And Delta eight is a, a, a little, a little easier on the onset and it lasts a little bit longer. Um, so it's like the diet Coke of pot. It's been, it's been said that, um, but again, this is like one of those weird gray areas. And I think that we're seeing a, a large influx of Delta eight due to, uh, you know, the CBD. So, um, you know, again, I'm not a hundred percent sure on how a lot of the, the major companies are producing Delta eight, but I do know that, um, instead of, Instead of deriving the plant, I'm sorry, deriving the Delta 8 from, let's say, like a standard cannabis plant that you would find at your dispensary, they're actually deriving Delta 8 directly from CBD. So they are, they are changing um, CBD through an isomerization process to Delta 8. So they're kind of doing some backwards, weird, um, you know, uh, chemistry science stuff. And that is great. And bad all at the same time so i think when it comes to delta 8 uh testing is paramount i think it's super important um anyone who's legally allowed to get delta 8 um i think they should do the research before trying it or buying it but uh the potency and the uh <clears throat> the the testing behind it i think is really important just to make sure that you know exactly what you're getting you know how it's derived so basically what you do is you would take CBD and you would dissolve it into a solvent. And then you would add an acid to that and then separate, um, you know, it goes through a separation process. And then you would add a base back to that to adjust the pH again. And then it would be, you know, uh, kind of distilled again, like we were talking about distillate before. Um, and so there's, uh, there's more chemical processes than some of your other standard extracts. And, um, you know, there could be some residual, uh, you know, leftovers. And it's just one of those things that I think with Delta 8, it's really important to get from reputable suppliers, which, again, I, I don't know. Um, it's just, you know, you'd have to do your research on your own. Um, but I think there's something to it. I think, uh, I think there could be, um, you know, it's just another derivative. And, uh, you know, apparently it's, it's helping, you know, certain medical patients and, and we'll see what happens in the future. But again, uh, I think the whole cannabis industry well, as a whole, uh, needs more testing and, uh, especially as the consumer, um, it comes to, you know, making sure that you have test results, you know, exactly what you're buying and what you're intaking into your system. I, I, I do have a question. So it sounds like Delta eight, you're talking about, it's a different derivative, but more or less, it sounds like it's a legal loophole. Right, which is why states where pot is illegal get Delta eight. Yeah, I mean and- it's it's one of those things that like um, you know uh, laws usually lag, I and mean, we kind of see it in multiple different industries. Uh, you know, as technology you know progresses, uh, laws kind of uh, they take a while to catch up. Um, the tech industry and how our society works is moving at a much faster rate than our, our regulation and legislation, um, you know, follows it. So, well, so my my one question as it relates to that, Ryan. Would be, so, okay, we outlaw Delta Eight. Is there so many derivatives within marijuana that okay, the federal government outlaws Delta Eight? Delta Eight. Who cares? There's Delta Seven or some other variant. That I've never heard of. I mean, is this just one of those things where you've opened up Pandora's box? There's no way to stop this. Like, there's always going to be something, a derivative of, yeah. of marijuana. Yes and no. So the endocannabinoid system, which is the system in our body, which uh, relates to the cannabis plant in many different ways. So it's, uh, you know, there's you can eat a tomato and, you know, it might have, you know, tomatoes have a little bit of nicotine in them and, you know, some other compounds, but they're not. Just like necessary. when I drink apple juice, there's a small, fra- there's a tiny, tiny bit of alcohol in it. Exactly. So there's, uh, you know, our, our bodies are made... Um, to take this plant in many different forms, but that is the So when you're talking about Delta-7, not 100% sure that molecule is even stable, to be 100% honest. And I don't know <laughs> if, you know, that will uh, actually, you know, that derivative will actually, you know, interact with our endocannabinoid receptors in our body. 
So again, uh, a lot of the cannabis testing that's been done over the years uh, was using, um, especially on a federal level, was using a such subpar, uh, you know, plant material, and we're talking like absolute garbage. So we're just now getting to the point where even you know any of these uh, medical facilities, your colleges, your universities, anyone doing like long-term cannabis studies, they're just now getting um, the ability to utilize their uh, studies using cannabis that can be found, like that people are actually using. Um, so it's just one of those things that there's some things moving really, really fast in the cannabis industry and some things that are moving really, really slow. And I think we just kind of, we need to bring all those things together, you know, and that's gonna take legislation. Very interesting. Well, thank you for really kind of helping to demystify a lot of that because there's just really so much going on. We could do many episodes on this. There's there's a lot to it, yeah. and uh, it's it's going to change. So, I mean, you could do this in six months, and it could be you know Delta Eight could be completely outlawed in all fifty states. You just never know. Yeah. So going back a little bit to your gardening, yeah. and um, even kind of talking about you know how you kind of got started with really trying to grow your own food and some suggestions. I know that there's been a lot of recent products aimed at consumers to kind of help simplify and demystify gardening, especially for those of us that don't have a green finger like yourself. Um, so there's there's products specifically like Aero Garden. Um, that generally, it's like the idea is that they give you something, you plug it in, you pop in the pods, and you just water it, and it makes makes wonderful food. Can you talk about a little bit about that, and what are some of the challenges that you see that the average consumer maybe doesn't know about gardening? Yeah, sure. So I've never used an arrow garden, so I can't specifically say on the product. Um, you know, I've seen a photo of some herbs growing in it, and I think that's about the limitation that you would get. Um, I don't think there's much control over that system. Um, so I can't speak directly to that product. Um, but I guess, you know, being an outdoor grower as well as an indoor grower, um, there's just there's a lot to consider. Um, I guess if you were, if you were looking to grow food inside, um, I think your, your options are pretty limited unless you want to, I would say, I would say no, just in the fact of your carbon footprint. Um, you know, as we all know, the sun is a ridiculous beast and the energy it outputs is amazing. Um, in order to grow any, sustainable foods other than like say some herbs inside uh you you need you need some specific lights that have some power behind them which means they draw some power and obviously you know there's solar and you know we're, we're moving our our uh, our energy consumption to to other places which is great until that is 100 percent renewable and green i would say it's almost impossible to like grow a tomato inside not to say that you couldn't do it i'm just saying that the mm -hmm. carbon Footprint. But sustainably, the yeah. carbon footprint for doing something like that would be something that I would not, I, I wouldn't condone. Um, it's just, it's not for me. Um, you know. Well, so so I just wanna I just wanna ask a question about that. So as a as an environmentally conscious person, you're saying, even though there's wonderful benefits of, of growing, and you obviously have experience with that, mm -hmm. you're probably better off buying your from a, from a from a local grocer that that from an environmentally conscious standpoint you'd be better off getting your fruits and vegetables well to be 100 percent honest uh you know a lot of the stuff you find at the grocery store isn't necessarily environmentally conscious but i guess the you know i'm not telling people how to eat and what to buy but at least in our household you know i i love a blt it's uh you know, it's, it's fantastic. It's like one of my favorite sandwiches. It's delicious. Um, I stop eating them in like, you know, the middle of fall. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't have tomatoes in the, I don't have fresh tomatoes in the wintertime. Just one of those things that like, I vary my cooking style. Uh, you know, it's dependent on, on what's available to me. And we were talking before about like, I started growing food to get the best product. And if you can't, source a good product like i can't find a good tomato right now i'm just not going to eat it you know i'll use canned tomatoes mm -hmm. all day those were harvested in the end of summer peak ripeness by all means go for it you know pasta sure um but if you asked me to get blt right now i'd be like eh. so just one of those things that's just where i stand on that 
Well, I guess if All you guys right. wanted to like jump into like, you know, I said maybe besides herbs, um, you know, it's really hard to grow something indoors. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to get into some, some outdoor growing, um, you know, I would just suggest, you know, it's, uh, it's one thing to go down to the store and buy, you know, pre-packaged, uh, miracle grow, whatever, and throw that in your garden. That's fine. But I, I think, um, you know, the same with a, a plate of food, you get out what you put in. And the same thing starts with the farmer or the grower. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important that people understand the basics of, you know, how to grow their own food. Um, and there's so many different ways and so many different uh, methods. And some are great, some are fine, um, some not so great. Um, you know, it's one of those things that's a, it's a labor of love. It's, it's a hobby. You know, I feel like everyone who's growing vegetables should at least uh, attempt to get out a product worthy of their time. And I think, uh, you know, that starts with soil. So like sourcing, you know, a good seed, um, is one thing, but then, you know, how you grow it is another and buying premix soil from home Depot. Yeah. You know, as a, as a, uh, connoisseur of growing, I would suggest against it. Um, but then again, you know, not everyone's trying to, uh, to, to spend a ridiculous amount of time and money to grow the best tomato. Um, so I would well, say so if I, I am trying to grow the best tomato, go uh, for mulch, I'm um, what, you, what would you say? I, I do pretty simple stuff. So I make my own composts, which, you know, it's pretty easy to do, but it's not for everyone. Um, I would just say instead of going and buying miracle Grow, is to make your own soil. It's a little bit extra work. Um, it can be cheaper, um, but I do a, a pretty basic three-part mix. So I get like a, like one part inert material. Um, so either that be like uh, coconut core. So like the husk from coconut, you can buy at, you know, grow shop, a nice garden supply store or peat moss. It's a little less sustainable. Um, but it's definitely available. It's more easily available. And it's just like this, uh, kind of fluffy fibrous material. Um, so that, uh, vermiculite, which you can usually find at, uh, you know, the garden store, you can even find it at Home Depot. It's a little expensive there, but you can go to your, uh, your, your local garden, so, uh, supply store and get something like that. Um, perlite, which is like these, uh, looks like white styrofoam. Um, it's basically just like a porous rock. It holds moisture. So if you live in a really hot climate, adding something like that to it and then uh, a good compost. Um, and I would say sourcing that from a local, um, you know, nursery or garden store. Um, so you basically have, uh, you know, one part compost, one part, um, you know, cocoa core, peat moss, and one part um, like aeration, water retention, whether it be like vermiculite or perlite is like a really good basic, um, you know, starting point. A lot of things grow in it. Obviously, you know, plants vary. You can't grow everything in it. But I think if you want to do a vegetable garden, it's, uh, it's fantastic. And it's one of those things that lasts a long time. So you go out and buy all these materials, you do a full season of gardening, and then next year you really don't have to do much to it. You just add some compost to it, mix it all up again, and you can grow again. So it's kind of a, a little more of an initial cost. Um, but you know, that's like the easiest way. And that's, that's actually really explained well in a book called, uh, square foot gardening. Um, I read it when I was younger, um, pretty solid goes over like the recipes and just kind of, um, you know, how to lay out a garden and like a four by four section. So it's easy to work on. So for someone starting out, uh, I think it's a great information. You can't really go wrong with square foot gardening. And that, that's where I'd start. And to be honest, uh, usually you have great success. I've helped a bunch of friends, family members kind of go that route. And, uh, you know, it kind of sparks something in them when they're like growing these awesome, awesome vegetables and, and plants. And, uh, you know, it's like I said, it's a labor of love. So starting with a good base and, and some basic information and you never know where it's going to lead you like for myself. Well, awesome. Ryan, you got me hungry for a BLT. Let me ask you this. You gave all the, the, in terms of the actual planting and the nurturing, where do you source your seeds? Are there online websites for, I want really good tomato seeds? I mean, like, how does that work? Sure. Um, I recently, I get most of my stuff from Johnny's seeds. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, 
I have some ins with some uh, some farmers, and they have some pretty ridiculous stuff. And um, but a lot of them use Johnny's, so that's kind of like my go to. They're a great seed bank. Um, you can get you know fifty different types of carrots if you want. Um, so I, I think they're reputable. They're well known, and uh, you know, good luck uh, sorting through their ridiculous catalog. So uh, solid seeds, solid food. I, I would go with Johnny's. Not not sponsored. <laughs> Love so, it. Trans- transitioning a little bit, getting back to your cooking, um, as and you're a chef. So I've heard a little bit about molecular gastronomy, and I know that you've worked in some really high end uh, kind of culinary labs. Sure. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is and how that relates to some of your own experience? Yeah, um, it's it's funny. Uh, you you kind of brought it up as like, oh, I've heard of this. And it's it's one of those like buzzwords that I don't think people really understand. Um, so I'll just break it down to the basics. Uh, molecular gastronomy is not a style of food. It is science. So molecular gastronomy is like a definition is the science of how the chemical breakdown of food works. And so if you've ever eaten a piece of food or ever cooked a piece of food, you've done molecular gastronomy. No. Whoa. Yeah. Right. I've done it. Right. I cooked chicken tonight. Yeah. If you cook food, you're a sci- you're a scientist through and through. There's so many uh, reactions that that you've witnessed and uh, catalyzed that you know you can definitely call yourself a scientist, even if you've warmed some soup up in the microwave. I don't care what anyone says. Now, what if I leave food out and let it rot? Am I still a scientist? You're more of a scientist. Ooh. I mean, Check look that. at there you go. look at uh, kimchi, fish sauce, sauerkrauts. Um, now yeah. we're talking. Now, now you're a cultural scientist. <laughs> Heck yeah! Um, but yeah, as as it pertains to kind of the question you were asking, um, yeah, it was a uh, it's kind of like a a big buzzword, probably ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and um, it kind of just described a, a different way of seeing food. Um, or working with food, plating food, eating food. Um, it was just kind of like a, a, a new way, you know, way back in the day you had, uh, you know, you had people surviving, you know, you'd go kill an animal, you'd make a harvest, you do what you can by cooking that to make it more calorie rich and so that your family and tribe could survive longer. And then as we developed into a more easygoing society where we created agriculture and we settled down and people had time, um, you know, our, our whole society as a, as a, as a being changed and with that food. So you kind of had a transition to the haute cuisine where, you know, food was, uh, more meticulous and there were techniques involved and, you know, then you had Escoffier come along and kind of write the basics for, uh, you know, French cuisine. And, you know, we've gone through, uh, many changes in the culinary world. And, you know, I think the last major change was the, the wave of molecular gastronomy. And it's just one of those things that, um, as, as you said, uh, you know, buzzword, it's basically in the, in the process of using hydrocolides to manipulate food. So whether that be using specific components to spherify, you know, specific um, like calcium rich foods or, you know, using, um, thickeners in different ways or, uh, liquid nitrogen, you know, uh, whatever it be. Um, it was just, uh, it just opened up, uh, uh, more techniques, um, and different plating styles and textures. And, uh, it's, um, I feel like it's kind of, come back a little bit it was like this big rage and now a lot of the you know at least the people i've worked with um you know we played with it we had fun and you know it's still there but you know we're more technique driven and we've come back to like you know using less of that but taking the mentality of that forward and again it's sourcing better products Um, now I feel like it's much more farmer driven where it's like this farm in this country is doing this crazy thing. And, you know, we're, we're the only restaurant they can have it instead of, you know, using all these crazy, uh, you know, hydrocolides to do like ridiculous things with food. So I, I, it's not gone, but I feel like that, that has peaked and has kind of, uh, 
changed in today's uh, food scene. And COVID has completely changed that again. So I feel like we're on the cusp of a different change. Hopefully we can go back to some type of normalcy. And I think uh, restaurants are going to, you know, they're going to go into a, a, a new chapter. Yeah. Well, I, I do have a question for you, getting back to like the home kitchen. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I feel that in the last couple of years, there's been this surge on things like air fryers, things like sous vides. And I, I guess one of the questions I have is, are, are those things that really people should be adding to their kitchen arsenal or, or are those, you know, made by vendors using kind of the trends to really just make a quick buck? Yeah. Um, you know, I've used sous vide for, I don't know, 15 years. I, it's, you know, it's, it's been in my repertoire since, you know, I, I started my culinary journey. Um, and they're, they're amazing machines. Um, they have really, uh, you know, they've kind of changed the game and like the workflow of like uh, a high end kitchen or any kitchen. Um, and when it comes to home cooking, they're just like anything else. They're a tool. Um, they can simplify some pretty complex processes and they can make a ease of use case for others. Um, so let's say you wanted to do like, you know, let's say you're, you have a huge family and you want to do eggs Benedict for, you know, 20 people and you don't want to poach all those eggs because you only have four or six burners at your house doing a, you know, a 60 minute egg and a sous vide will make you perfect poach eggs and it's it's a separate tool and you don't have to worry about it. you don't have to sit there and poach 20 or 40 eggs if you do two eggs benedict for 20 people um or if you know you don't want to smell up the house but you want to cook some fish you know you could you could use utilize that um as like a high-end dinner party and you don't want your house reeking of whatever you know weird fish that you bought at the market. Um, so you could like condense that smell and, you know, make perfectly cooked fish. Uh, you could also do like, you know, a massive ribeye and you could do kind of like a reverse sear, um, for like, an, again, like a, a larger family, they want to do ribeyes and they don't want to, you know, come home half a day early from work to, to set it up. They could set it up before they leave for work cook that thing for eight hours, come home, drop it in a 550 degree oven, and you know it's going to be good. You don't have to watch it. So there are situations where sous vide is perfect for a home cook and definitely utilized in, in many kitchens. Um, as far as air fryers, um, not 100% familiar with them. I'm not going to lie. I received one as a gift for Christmas. Um, but after looking at it and using it, I think I've used it twice, um, it's just a, it's a really solid, small, high convection oven, which, you know, a lot of high-end kitchens have. So there's nothing really different about an air fryer from like a high-end kitchen, you know, commercial kitchen oven, except for, you know, you now have a convection oven at home. And not everyone does. Like I had a convection oven at my house already because, you know, I, I'm going to utilize it. But you know, with the air fryer, it's like, you know, you can heat up something small, quick. It's not this huge thing. It's not this huge, expensive thing. So it has its uses. So I think there's this like dichotomy of home cooking and commercial kitchens. Those are kind of converging on themselves with some, uh, some pretty solid products. Awesome. I have one last question before we go. I'm not a good cook, Ryan. Mm. I try, you know, I know the basics, Right. I, I'm pretty good with eggs, you know. Well, hold on, hold but, on. But I will say one thing. If you're good with eggs, you are a fantastic cook. I'm not going to lie. I have a two-step interview process. If I am looking for a solid cook, I will sit down with them and talk to them. You spend 15, 16 hours a day with this person, you're going to need to get along. And if I feel like I can get along with this person or that, you know, they just have a general, like good personality, they're not negative, they're not crackhead, whatever. Um, next step of my interview, you go cook me an egg three ways. Wow. I can tell you everything I need to know about a person by how they cook eggs. 
So if you can cook eggs in multiple ways and they're good, you're a good cook. All right. Hey, thank you. All right. So as a good cook, but, <laughs> but let's be honest, not really, right? Like I know the basics, right? I can, I can follow instructions, but if I wanted to impress my wife one night, right? Really home cooked meal, something that's not overly complicated, but is going to dazzle. Sure. What, what's, what's a quick meal off the top of your head that you'd go, this is what you do. You're going to impress. I can't tell you the meal, but I can give you some pointers. Again, All right. I, will, I'm in. I will say it. Sorry for the language. You can't turn shit into sugar. Find good product. If you want to blow your wife away, find good product and don't mess it up. That's it. Another thing, taste your food. When I cook, like as a chef, like you don't really eat, you don't really eat meals. Like you might crush some food at like 1 a.m. before you go to bed. But, you know, from the time you walk into the kitchen to the time you're done, like serving your last dish, you're eating constantly. Taste your food, taste your food, taste your food. It's like, it's step one of becoming a better cook. Um, salt acid uh another thing so let's say you're making a soup right if you don't know that soup well and you don't know exactly how much salt or maybe even acid soup and acid's a little weird but you know it it, it mends um so let's say you, you're making your wife a soup take some of that soup out into a small bowl add some salt to it and taste it and then add some more salt to it and taste it add more salt taste it. Do that until it tastes like absolute crap. But you know the progression of how much salt that that product specifically specifically can take. So products with higher fat or acid can take more salt. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things. Taste your food. If you have to separate some and ruin it, that's fine. But you'll know the progression. So when you go back and you go to season your large batch of food, you know when you're going to get to a point where you think, oh, this was this was the bite I'm looking for. This is where I stop. So That's great advice. Again, find, I never thought about that. Find good product and don't be afraid to ruin a little bit of it. Don't do too much to it and just yeah. start with technique. Cooking is all about technique. So let's say you wanted to do asparagus something simple or whatever it's one of those products you can find some of it's great but you know you, a lot of the stuff you're going to find is pretty like even keel there's tons of different ways to cook it you can blanch it you can grill it um you know work on a technique uh take multiple different products and and you know do that same technique to them and just build your repertoire don't be afraid to like bust out a pan on the side while you're waiting for something else to cook and like take a little bit of the product like one of the greatest things i've I like played with as a joke one time in the kitchen is I fried a carrot. I just dropped a whole carrot in the fryer. I was like, watch that till it's done as a joke. And we pulled it out and we started playing with it. And it had this ridiculous texture and we ended up like using it as a hot dog. We ended up using it in tacos. So like play with your food, uh, you know, especially when you're just sitting around. Um, and another thing is have, have a sharp knife, you know, and make your, your life so much easier. Um, having the right tools in the kitchen is sometimes really hard to come by. Some of them are expensive, but having a sharp knife and knowing how to use it really like sets you aside. Ryan, when you said play with the food earlier, you know what I thought? Because I learned this from you. Be a scientist. Exactly. And I, be will, a scientist. I will tell you, there's more science done in food and in kitchens than most labs around. The amount of variables, the amount of reactions, the chemistry, the botany, the amount of science that goes into a plate, not even to mention with like the art behind that is immense. And that's what I love about it, what drew me to it in the first place, and is why I'll continue to do it till the day I die. We need to open up a restaurant called The Laboratory, or if it's a British pub, we'll call it The Laboratory. <laughs> uh, there is one. It's in Boston. I think it's called. Oh, the, you missed that, it's, Alex. It's called the Lab. Uh, I think it opened like I'm gonna say I don't know, maybe nine years ago. Hmm. Somehow you missed it while you were out there, Alex. But next time you're back, <laughs> make sure to have Ryan take you there. Well. Sure. Hey, listen. This has been a delight, Ryan. Thank you so much for introducing us to. A whole new world. 
Um, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for being an awesome guest. And uh, with that, we'll wrap up the episode. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It was fun. You're welcome. Thank you.